Stu, I went into brain science because I hoped I could use the knowledge I gained to discover the underlying fundamental aspects of reality. And while I loved the research, I came up short. So what can we say about science and its capacity to discover ultimate reality? I'm going to give a, a surprising answer. We have believed since Newton, who was stunning. I mean, how much does one need from one mind? He gives us differential and integral calculus, <laughs> three laws of motion, universal gravitation, celestial mechanics, <laughs> billiard balls. <laughs> how much do you want? <laughs> we have believed since Newton, if not Pythagoras, that there is or will be a body of theory. Um, and now let me be careful. When you apply Newton's laws to say to billiard balls, you need the initial conditions, the position and momenta of the balls, and you need the boundary conditions, the shape of the billiard table. And you write down the differential equations, then you integrate them. Integration is deduction, and it is entailment. So Newton taught us to do that, to get the trajectory of the balls. And then Laplace said, once Same you know thing. that, you can Once go you know forward that, you know, or backward. Forward, backward for the universe, for all, all if we knew the positions <laughs> and momentum, all the particles in the universe. We have believed since Newton, if not Pythagoras, that there is a body of law, or a law, on Steve Weinberg's t-shirt, okay, <laughs> that entails everything that happens in the universe. Mm -hmm. I'm persuaded that that view is profoundly wrong. Okay, now why? Because that's critical. Yeah, it is critical. So, so where I think it goes wrong is what I'm calling the watershed of life. So Heraclitus, 2,500 years ago, said in a slight misquote of Heraclitus, the universe bubbles forth. It's just mm -hmm. this lovely image. Um, and notice that in Genesis, God creates the universe outside of entailing laws, and Heraclitus, as the universe bubbles forth, mm. is outside of mm -hmm. entailing laws. And it's really important to mention here uh, that the early sociologist Max Weber said that with Newton, we became <coughs> disenchanted and entered modernity. It shapes the way we are in the world. We're still under the spell of Newton. And I think it's inadequate, which is an enormous claim, and it's work I'm doing with Giuseppe Longo, who's a um, senior French-Italian mathematician, just moving from the École Normale Supérieure to, uh, in Paris to the École Polytechnique. So he and I are writing an article on this, and, and I've uh, published a blog on it, brazenly entitled, um, The End of a Physics Worldview, <coughs> Heraclitus in the Watershed of Life. To say it, I have to say, essentially seven things. So I know that time <laughs> is pressed, but I'm going to try to do it. Um, statement one. Neither quantum mechanics nor classical physics itself alone describes the evolution of the biosphere. Here it is. With contemporary organisms, mutations are quantum, random, indeterminate events on the Copenhagen interpretation. Okay. Okay, so they're indeterminate and they're random, okay, by the Born rule in quantum mechanics. But natural selection isn't random, as seen in the evolution of the octopus camera eye and our camera eye, independently evolved. Well, that's not random. That means that evolution is neither determinate nor is it <laughs> random. That means it's not captured by classical physics, and it's not captured by quantum mechanics alone. It's new. So that's statement one. Statement two is I, I want to get to what I'm going to call a Kantian whole, which of course derives from Kant, who, who talked as follows. He said, an organized being then has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole that organizes their behavior, uh, but the whole exists for and by means of the parts. So he had this idea a long time ago, in the 1770 or something. Well, I'm going to give you a crisp example. In, in 71, I invented the idea of a collectively autocatalytic set of proteins. Gonan Ashkenazi in Ben-Gurion University has one. So here's what it is. He has nine small proteins called peptides. 
And each peptide catalyzes a reaction that takes two fragments of one of the other peptides and ligates them or glues them together into a second copy of the other peptide so that the set as a whole catalyzes all of the reactions that have to happen so that the set is collectively autocatalytic. So it really exists. Okay. Conan's got it. Okay, let's go on. Okay, now, uh, this proves, by the way, that life need not be based on template replicating DNA and RNA, which is a big story, and it's not mine. It's Conan and Reza Gadiri at Scripps who've done this. Uh, even though my first story was about peptide autocatalytic sets. Well, this is a Kantian whole. Mm -hmm. um, and now we can say <clears throat> something that we can't say in physics. We can say that the function of a peptide is the role that it plays in the reproduction of the Kantian whole, autocatalytic set. Okay? So we can define function. But you can't talk about the function of a ball rolling down a bowl. Okay, so there's, Kantian holes allow us to talk about function. Now I want to introduce the next idea. If we think of catalysis as a catalytic task, the autocatalytic set achieves what I want to call task closure. All the reactions that have to get catalyzed do get catalyzed, and it works. So the next thing we have to go to is a, a normal cell, for example, a skin cell, a eukaryotic cell. It's dividing, say. It achieves closure in a very much wider space of tasks. For example, mitosis, where uh, the chromosomes move apart, making membranes, making, making, uh, capturing energy, doing work cycles, all sorts of things. So there's some wide set of tasks that a, a cell really achieves. So hold that, okay, because I'm going to build on it in a surprising way to me by going to the following weird step. Robert, please tell me all the uses of a screwdriver, a plumber's helper, mm -hmm. And a big piece of plywood. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> right. You can't do it. And this is going to really be important for us. Let me tell you why I think we can't do it. The set of uses of these three objects, or some indefinite set of objects, just a screwdriver or whatever, the set of uses is either maybe infinite, but it's certainly indefinite. Second, there's no ordering relationship. The first one, mm. the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, like there are for the integers. What that means is something fundamental. There is no effective procedure in the computer science sense. There's no algorithm that can list all the possible uses of a screwdriver, which is why you said no. Right. Okay. So I've just said something that's big. Mm. There's no way to list them all. But they happen in evolution. So suppose that the screwdriver and the plumber's helper and so on were molecules in a cell. I'll give just one example. The flagellar motor, the famous flagellar motor in a bacterium that makes it swim up or helps it swim up a gradient, is derived by what are called Darwinian pre-adaptations, which we can go into now or later if you wish, um, from two or three or four other smaller fragments of the flagellar motor that are playing entirely different functional roles and then got assembled into and co-opted into this new function, namely being a flagellar motor. That means the following, and, and I found the way that I like to say it. All we need is that some parts, some physical structures or processes, alone or together, find a use that enhances the fitness of the cell and are heritably variable, so natural selection can act on them, and that new use comes to exist in the biosphere. But we <clears> couldn't <throat> say it beforehand. We couldn't say it beforehand. Fundamentally unpredictable. Fundamentally unpredictable. There's no finite alphabet of parts like there is, for example, for a computer, okay, uh, with ones and zeros. We can't pre-state the alphabet of parts. So what's the implication of that? If there is no law, no way that you can fundamentally predict Well, I haven't gotten to no law yet. I'm, okay. I'm one step away from it. <laughs> um, Giuseppe Longo, who's a mathematician, assures me that the contemporary account of mathematics is that it's semantic laden. The ideas have meaning. That's not the formal approach to mathematics, which is syntactic which Giuseppe argues against. So let me give an example. 
Um, if you want the law of the pendulum, you need the length of the pendulum and the mass of the pendulum. And you have the idea of length and mass before you write down the law of the pendulum. You need a settled, if Giuseppe were here, he would say, you need a settled sense of the semantics of those words. Or for, for Newton's first law of motion, sure. you need inertia. For the second law, you need mass, F is equal to ma. That is to say, we have to have pre-established concepts that have settled meanings to write down the equations. But we don't know the relevant variables that natural selection will pluck out of these Kantian holes. We don't know the relevant variables. Therefore, we cannot write down the equations about these relevant variables, so we don't have the equations of motion for the biosphere. We, don't, we can't write them down. It, the, it's not that we're not smart enough to write them down. It's that correct. it's impossible to write it, them down. It's impossible to write them down. And there's a last point, okay, which is um, think of a, a, a biological niche, okay, for example, for the flagellar motor. Uh, in general, you could think of a niche as kind of the boundary conditions. It's like the shape of the table for the billiard balls. But we don't know the niche. So if we don't know the niche that shapes how selection acts, we can't integrate the equations of motion of the biosphere, and we don't have those equations anyway. So neither do we have the equations, nor if we had them, could we integrate them. It would be like asking, um, can I integrate the equations of motion of the billiard balls if the table is changing shape in ways that I don't know all the time? I can't. I don't even have a mathematical model. So I'm saying something truly radical. There is no mathematization, no mathematization of the detailed becoming of the biosphere. Therefore, there is no law for the detailed becoming of the biosphere. I think Kantian holes are a sufficient condition for this. I'm not sure that they're a necessary condition. Right now, if I had to bet, I'd say yes. But it's because you have Kantian holes that selection, when it's acting on the Kantian hole, like the cell, with the flagellar motor, that selection picks out the un unprestatable, newly relevant variables. <laughs> That's why. That's why. And it's happening all the time. And it happens in the economy. So what's the implication of this for the possibility that science, in its deterministic way, can give us ultimate answers? I think that the answer is that if our model of science is the way glorious Newton taught us to think, the answer is there's no theory down there that entails, in the sense that I gave, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by integration, the becoming of the biosphere and a fortiori human life. And I think it changes how we are in the world. I think, it, I think if you go back to Max Weber uh, saying that with Newton, uh, we became disenchanted, which we did in the mechanical world, and we entered modernity, this is saying for the first time, maybe we can think something new. We're in the world in a different way. The world is not what we thought. And I think it's huge, but I don't know what huge is. Okay. <laughs>